is the greatest gift that the church has for the world it is the gospel the gospel is holistic that's why jesus said the spirit of the lord god is upon me he has anointed me to preach the good news but also to do what to bite the brokenhearted to comfort those who mourn and to provide for those who mourn in zion god is shaking that which can be shaken so that what is unshakable may remain Haggai says when these men of God lived in their day they did not know that it would be recorded in the Bible that we are reading today what they were doing was just living for God one day at a time the cross represents the greatest adversity that one can experience Jesus endured the cross and overcame so that in adversity we may have hope every person is under pressure economies are strayed left right and center how can we endure how can we stand strong from this moment and this is the prayer that i pray for you i pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and i pray that you will be rooted and established in love. What a blessing again <clears throat> to come to you. We continue with our journey through the book of um, Philippians. And uh, this is our seventh uh, uh, session in the series. This is joy. And... Um, Today, our topic is, this is joy, that we may be one. <clears throat> that we may be one. And we continue with Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, which we began last Sunday. The Bible says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing <coughs> out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but if each of you to the interests of others. As we saw in our last service, the call to unity that Paul gives us in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to 4 is set in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, when Paul says, Start firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Whatever happens, whatever we do, whatever Paul talks about here, whatever unity we pursue, the one goal is that in one spirit, we may strive as one for the faith of the gospel. That is the supreme thing, to show ourselves as Christ-like people, as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. The key message of Philippians chapter 2 verse 1 to 4 just to remind ourselves is that our union with Christ is the basis of our union with our, our unity in Christ. Our union with Christ is the basis of our unity with each other. Our relationship with Christ is the basis of our relationship with each other. How I relate with Christ determines how I relate with other people. At the heart of every form of disunity, because disunity takes many different forms, at the heart of disunity is a heart problem. There's a heart problem. There is a work that Christ needs to do in me. You see, disunity is a very, very um, widespread thing. Paul here is addressing disunity in church, but we have disunity in the nation. We have disunity in the family. We have disunity in relationship. 
at the heart of every disunity is actually a heart problem. We live in a fallen world, and because disunity is so widespread, it may look like a normal thing, but it's a heart problem. Indeed, at the heart of the racial conflict bedeviling the USA is a heart problem. And I urge you to continue praying for our brothers and, our, and sisters in this country. It's a heart problem. When I have an issue with my wife, for example, it may look like normal human behavior. But if you look at pro protracted conflicts, you will realize it's a heart problem. Today, we look at two things. Number one, the foundation of Christian unity. The foundation of Christian unity. And number two, the formation of uh, unity. So the foundation and the formation. The foundation of our unity. Two things, the first of which we have already looked at in our last service. Our basis for unity is the work that Christ has done in us. Our basis for unity is the work that Christ has done in us. And we looked at that in Philippians chapter 2 verse 1. His consolation, his comfort, his communion, his compassion. All this work that Christ has done in me motivates, moves me, enables me to live, uh, enables us to live a united life. It gives us what we need, all the blessings that we need to live in unity, as we said, as we looked at this text. The second thing in the foundation of Christian unity is the motivation we receive from the example of Christ. Our motivation for unity is the example of Christ for us. Verse 5 of chapter 2, which we'll look at in detail next Sunday, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So Christ has set an example, an attitude, a practice, a being, a way of life. In the book of John chapter 17, verse 20 to 23, Jesus, or if you read the whole text, John chapter 17 records Jesus praying for the disciples and then he prayed for the whole church, including you and me, everyone who will believe in him. And he prays among many things, he prays for unity. And in that prayer, he shows us that our basis for unity, our motivation for unity is the unity that he has with the Father. Verse 20, I pray also for those who will believe in me that they may be one as we are one. That they may be one as we are one. Christ has set an example for us. You see, there is no division in God. There is no division in Christ. And there, therefore, there ought to be no division in his body. And his body is the church. We must be one as God. The Trinity is one. Because we don't believe in three divided gods. We don't believe in three gods as some mistake. We believe in one God. And that one God lives forever. Exists in three. The God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And there is no division. God is one. And says as you are in me and I am in you. Jesus says I pray that they too may be one. Disunity in the church or in families that make mention of the name of the Lord negates and distorts the message of Christ. Remember the basis of a call for unity. We must strive as one for the message of the gospel. Whether it is within the four walls of the church, like I, we are in church right now, some of us, or it is within the four walls of our homes, or in any other kind of relationship, we must strive as one. James says in chapter 3 and verse 16, for where we have envy and selfish abation, there you find disorder and every evil 
practice. Disunity breeds disorder. It, dis it breeds indiscipline and every evil practice. But where Christ rules, there is order, there is harmony, there is discipline, there is unity. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Christ has set for us an example or Paul sets for us an example or gives us a picture, a portrait of unity. Verse 2. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Let's look at these scriptures here. This term that Paul uses. One mind. One mind does not mean uniformity of thought, like robots, or absence of thought or opinion. That actually is a cultic tendency. Many cultic leaders will take away from you the right to think, even the ability if you allow them to think. Rather, our unity in Christ is unit in spite of our diversity. It is unity within our diversity. It is having the same goals, the same God-given vision as a local church, in a marriage, in a relationship, in teams. It is having the same vision, the same goal, the same purpose, the same mind. The Bible says two cannot work together unless they agree, unless they are of one mind. Thank God for the one mind that God has given us as grace you. The one mind that God has given many of us in our families, in our relationships. It's the gift of God. And then the other two are one love and one spirit. One love literally means there can also be divided love. That is factions, you know, division. Where you have groups. I love, but I love people who are like me. I love, but I love people who are like this. I love, but I love within my circle. This one love and one spirit is God-given capacity to show compassion, to show love to everyone, to be able to forgive, to have forbearance, to show generosity. It is more than, you know, a human will. It is the enablement of God to be selfless. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13, Paul shows us that all these things are enabled by God. That is how I am able to love. He says, for it is God who works in you to will, that is to desire, but also to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. You see, Sometimes on matters of love, one love, one spirit, loving people unconditionally, however they are, however they look like, is easier said than done. Some people are hard to love. It is good to agree that. Because they are insolent. Because, you know, they, 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 they may be abusive. They are difficult people. I was in a supermarket this week and, um, just in front of me at the cashier was one was a lady who was being served i don't know what happened between her and the cashier but um she let out expletives you know really insults and demanding to see the manager and i could tell it was a very minor thing that there were uh, that, that was causing a problem and actually people because she was raising her voice people just looked at her the other cashiers the other shoppers just looked at her and how do you love people who have such an attitude? It is because Christ works in you both to will and to act according to his good purpose. It is Christ who enables us. So the foundation of Christian unity is what Christ has done in us and the example that Christ has set for us. That is the foundation on which we build our unity. Now the formation of Christian unity. Two things. The first one 
Unity starts with victory over self-worship. Victory over self-worship. Verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. There are two words there that I want us to look at. Selfish, selfish ambition and vain conceit. The first one, selfish ambition, seeks personal gain at the expense of others. Now the other one, which is vain conceit or pride, seeks personal glory many times at the expense of God. Selfish ambition, seeking personal gain. Vain conceit, seeking personal glory. Self, uh, uh, selfishness or selfish ambition is inordinate self-love, self-promotion. This may be hard for many of us to really wrap our minds around because in the generation we are in, we are taught love yourself above everything else. Worship yourself. Put yourself first. Look out for number one. You need to be first. You know, I read someplace that years ago when the state of Illinois in um, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, decided to give personalized number plates for, uh, for, for motor vehicles. The Department of Motor Vehicles was overwhelmed by the number of people who were applying for number one, zero, zero, one. Everybody wanted to, be, to come first. They had over 1,000 who wanted zero, zero, one in the state. And the state officer whose duty it was to offer, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to assign these numbers, is uh, quoted as saying, I'm not about to give this number to anyone and annoy or disappoint a thousand other people. So what was the solution? He allocated the number one to himself. That's our world. The word that Paul uses here for selfish, selfish ambition is a very, very um, telling word. That word refers to a hiring. You remember Jesus saying in the book of uh, John chapter 10 that uh, a hiring runs away when uh, the, uh, the, the, the sheep are under attack. It also means mercenary. A person who is hired to fight but who has no connection with uh, anything else apart from um, the fact that he is fighting for his own interest is a hiring or a mercenary working solely for personal gain not for the good of any other and the word that Paul uses for vain concept means highly exaggerated or hollow, empty self view you see, vain conceit or pride looks at the mirror every morning points at the person standing before the mirror and then sings the song how great thou art because the greatest person to the vain conceited person is themselves it is not another it's not even the lord self-worship let me give you an example of vain conceit in the 15th century in Florence, which was um, a Roman colony, a Catholic priest, a preacher, the Catholic priest, who was uh, visiting the, uh, Florence, and he was uh, there for some time, was intrigued by the sight of an elderly lady who was seen daily worshipping at the imposing um, statue of the Virgin Mary, which was um, prominently displayed at the great cathedral in the city of Florence. And the priest was very impressed. This is an elderly woman. Every morning, she's coming there. She's bowing down. Every evening, she is back. She is bowing down. And the priest mentioned to some other people and said, I admire the devotion of this old woman. And the people who had lived in that town for long told him, preacher, don't be too impressed with this woman. Let's give you a story. Many years ago, the cathedral wanted someone to make a sculpture of the Virgin Mary. 
and they looked for the best capture, uh, the, be the, the, the best uh, artist they could get. When they got the artist, the artist started by looking for a lady within the town. A young girl who would pose as the Madonna, who would pose for, as the Virgin Mary. They found a young, beautiful girl and the artist liked her. And so they said to the preacher, the, what you see there, the statue of Virgin Mary, was inspired by that beautiful young woman many years ago. And now, that old woman you see there worshipping was that young girl who was the model for that statue. The moment she saw the statue of the Virgin Mary, she fell in love with herself and has been coming to worship herself ever since she was a young girl until now, bowing down continuously to herself. How easy to fall in love with ourselves. I want to give you a few marks of self-worship. Marks of self-worship. A self-worshipper is self-absorbed. Self-absorbed. I is the most important alphabet in is the most important letter in the alphabet of the self-worshipper. It's the most important in the alphabet of the self-worshipper. My happiness, my progress, my comfort, my rights, especially my rights. Second Timothy chapter 2, chapter 3, verse 2, Paul says, In the last days, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, and look boastful and proud. That a self-absorbed person, lovers of themselves, boastful and proud. Boastful means that it is outward. They speak about themselves. Pride can be very subtle and very hidden. The second thing or the second mark is self-seeking pursuits. People who are self-worshippers are self-seeking. They are prone to greed a negative competition. At the heart of a corruption menace in our nation is a self-seeking heart. Greed. Selfishness. Always wanting to be number one. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 1 says, an unfriendly person pursues selfish ends and against all sound judgment starts quarrels. An unfriendly person, the person who does not pursue unity, pursues selfish ends. Because you see, unity and selfishness cannot mix. They cannot mix. If you are pursuing your own selfish ends, then you'll be unfriendly. Because you want to be fast. And I want to be fast. So we'll compete. And against all sound judgment, we will quarrel. We will compete. We will fight. Now, the other mark of self-worship is self-pity. You see, I say boastfulness is open pride. Loud pride. Talk about yourself. But pride is manifested in many different ways. And one of the subtle ways that we manifest pride is self-pity. Because what is self-pity? Self-pity is being engrossed with yourself. It is actually being caught up with yourself. You are the center of your world. You complain about everything. You complain about people. You complain about how you are treated. You complain about those who are ahead of you. You complain about those who are better than you. You, comp you complain about everything. The eye of in this case, it's about, I am not treated well, I am not good enough, I am not, I don't have what it takes, I don't have this, I don't have this, I don't have the other. And to add to that, very close to self-pity, the self-worshipper is an easily offended person. It's a very easily offended person. That is why it is very hard to have unity where this person is. The eye of the self-worshipper is very, very delicate. 
and is easily wounded. Very easily wounded. For the years that I have been involved in counseling, every time, or most of the times, rather not every time, but perhaps 80% or even 90% of the times when I am involved in counseling where a relationship is strained, whether between friends, business partners, or between a husband and a wife. At the very core is a wounded heart. And I realize quite often that we want to hold on to our wounds. We want to hold on to that anger. It becomes the altar at which we worship. Where we bow. Because it gives us control. You know, it gives us some control over the people. If I forgive and I am no longer angry, then I cannot control you. But if I am wounded and I am not forgiving and, I'm, you, and you have not for, we have not forgiven each other, it means I have some control over you. Because I want to make you feel angry. I want to make you feel bad. Easily offended. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 19. It says, A brother offended is more unyielding than a strong city. A brother offended is more unyielding than a strong city. Now, understand what this means. A strong city in the context of Proverbs 18 was walled. It was, um, it was buttressed with very strong walls, sometimes double walls. It was protected, all right? And it was hard for you to come inside. A brother or a sister who keeps offense, who traces themselves, they have a layer and a layer. You cannot reach them. And the reason they do that is because it gives them a sense of power to remain angry. It gives them a sense of power to remain un annoyed. They are unyielding. Self-worship. And unity can never thrive in such kind of an environment. And the, the, fifth, the, uh, the, the fifth thing is a stubborn spirit. A spirit that is hard to correct. A people that do not want to hear you are wrong. A people who cannot take positive criticism. A people who are so important that they are always right. They are always right. Proverbs 26 verse 12. I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. All the other readings I haven't mentioned are from the NIV. The Bible says, Do you see a man who is unteachable and wise in his own eyes and full of self-conceit? There is more hope for a fool than him. A person who is unteachable, wise in their own eyes, and a fool of self-conceit. There is more hope for them than a fool. And so those are the marks of a self-worshipper. We must overcome the temptation of self-worship. For there to be uh, an environment of love and unity. And finally, and this is just an introduction to where we shall pick on. Uh, take up from uh, the next uh, lesson. Our unity is perfected through self-sacrifice. Our unity, we have said, starts with victory over self-worship. And finally, it is perfected through self-sacrifice. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Verse 3, verse 4, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships, verse 5, which we shall get to next Sunday, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Humility is voluntary loss for the sake of another. And the greatest example of humility is Jesus Christ himself. That's why I'm excited that we'll be able to look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 11 which is one of the most elaborate scriptures in the Bible on the example of humility from Jesus. We do that next Sunday. 
Warren Wisby is a Bible uh, commentary writer, and he says, um, commenting on uh, Philippians, the secret of joy in spite of circumstances, then he says, remember Paul is writing from prison, the secret of joy in spite of circumstances is maintaining a single mind. And the secret of joy in spite of people is maintaining a submissive or humble mind. The secret of joy in spite of circumstances, which you've been talking about, is having a single mind that is focused on Christ. But the secret of joy in spite of people, because people can steal your joy. We are not called to be united because we are good. That we are in a place of perfect people. It is in spite of the badness of people. It is in spite of the weakness of people. It is in spite of the humanness of the people around us. And so he says, the secret of joy in spite of people is maintaining a submissive or a humble mind. And to quote another person, says, joy should always be understood by looking at the three letters, joy. J is for Jesus Christ first, O is for others next, and U is for yourself last. I want to invite you for a moment of reflection as we take time to pray. As I said, we shall pick up on uh, uh, self-sacrifice and humility next Sunday as we continue in, in our journey through Philippians. But today as we pray, I want us to think especially on the issue of self-worship. How important is the eye in me? I invite you to allow the Lord to search your heart. Oh, that you'd pray and ask him, search me and try me, oh Lord. Search me and try me. See if there is any evil way in me. Am I guilty of setting myself up as my own idol? Like that woman who from many years Seemed to be worshipping, but she was bowing to herself. Am I guilty of self-worship? Examine yourself. And as we do so, I want to ask you to look inward. Could you, by any means, even remotely, have a mercenary spirit or the spirit of a hiring? That everything you do is for your own head. You see, all of us work for our own benefit. But as I work, I'm also working for the benefit of, say, my employer and also for the consumers of that product. But a mercenary spirit doesn't care who I step on along the way, who I hurt, who I destroy. It's a negatively competitive spirit. A hiring spirit is what I will get out of it. Could I by any means, even Limotri, have a hiring spirit, a mercenary spirit? That is the word selfish ambition that Paul uses. Mercenary or hiring. Am I self-absorbed with my happiness, with my progress, with my comfort, with my rights at the expense of others? Do I put others first? Am I always looking out for my number one? Is there any bit of pride in me? Am I guilty of self-pity? Lord, look inside me and search my heart. Am I always complaining and seeing how disadvantaged I am full of anxiety, self-pity? It is a mark of a self-worshipper. Self-pity is a way of bowing down to yourself. May the Lord forgive me. May the Lord forgive us. Am I self-seeking? Am I over the self-conscious? Am I, do I have a stubborn spirit that cannot be corrected? Am I offended? 
and I find it so hard to release my bitterness, my offense, my anger. Am I an offended brother or sister who cannot let go and put trust inside? I worship at the altar of my anger, at the altar of my bitterness. There can never be unity unless we break those altars of bitterness and anger. I invite you to pray and ask the Lord, Oh God, I yield my heart to you. My, the foundation of our unity is the work that Christ has done in us. Celebrate that work. Allow Christ to continue working. He who began this good work will bring you to completion. And our motivation is the example of Christ. And the building blocks for unity is overcoming self-worship and living a life of self-sacrifice. I invite you to just talk to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray for every one of us. Oh, that you'd help us to pour out our hearts to you, our minds, our everything to you. Have your way, have your way, Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that in every one of us, you may overcome the spirit of self-worship. Where there is self-pity, where there is self-absorption, where there is bitterness, where there is anger, where there is greed, where there is pride, where we are looking out for number one. I ask you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, would you forgive us and in bring humility, work, in, work humility inside us. God, we give you our hearts, we give you our minds. I pray today that we shall be a united people. I pray for the unity of the body of Jesus Christ. I pray for the unity of Grace Hill. And thank you for the unity we continue to enjoy. I thank you for, I pray for unity in our families. I pray for unity in our nation. Oh Lord God Almighty. We pray for what we see in the U.S. That Lord you may bring unity that comes from the heart. We bless you Jesus. Thank you Lord. And I pray that you'd answer the prayer of everyone. Who is praying in their hearts. Forgive, Lord. Save me. Transform my life. Change me. Those who are praying for the healing of their relationships, do it, Lord. And help them to take the first step by letting go of offense. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We love you. Now I pray for your people. May we walk in the joy of the Lord. May we walk in the victory of the Holy Spirit. May you provide our food, our waters. Even in these difficult times, may we have enough. May, we, may you meet all our needs, O oh God. Bless the labors of our hands. May you open doors, O oh God, for us. And I ask that this week, O oh God, that every one of us will have a heart where Christ reigns. A heart where Christ alone is worshipped. That every God apart from you shall be broken. That we shall not bow down to ourselves. So I bless your people with the blessing of your word. May we make your heart, may you make your joy complete and the joy of each other complete by being of one mind, of one spirit, of one love. In Jesus' name we pray.